Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Name New York's first great modern skyscraper, and how tall was it? Wrong! It was Louis Sullivan's Guarantee Building, built in 1896. It was 12 stories tall, and in Buffalo, New York. Looking at it today, you might not call it modern or even a skyscraper, but for 1896, it was something new. It was taller than people dare build before there were steel structures, safe elevators, and indoor plumbing. As for its modernity, it is not a glass box, but it did eschew the traditional Gothic ornament that most architects used to hide and give context to their towers. Essentially, until Sullivan, no one was trying to develop a new aesthetic for this new kind of building, which might eventually be deemed modern architecture. Louis Sullivan was born in 1856, skipped his first two years of MIT, worked for a bit, but then studied at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, as did many of the prominent traditionalist architects of his era. By 1883, at the age of 27, Sullivan was a partner in Dakmar Adler's Chicago firm, which was busy rebuilding the city after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. The amount of talent drawn to Chicago because of Mrs. O'Leary's legendary cow became the crucible in which modern architecture was developed. New ways of building were being tried out, and this included a new style of architecture. Modernist architects rode the modernist philosophical and political movements which discarded history and tradition to replace it with rational thought. The transition of thought can be traced back to René Descartes and Immanuel Kant, who saw reason with revelation as essential to man's understanding himself physically and spiritually. But by the time we reached Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, the whole assumption of humankind's spirituality is getting tossed aside, and they promulgated an idea that humans were only rational and physical beings and they often looked down upon most people's limited rationality, which they believe led them to religion and spirituality. This modern philosophy, at its most stark, ignored that humans are also spiritual and compassionate beings, and they certainly rejected the very idea of divine revelation. You might say none of this has anything to do with architecture. WRONG! Just look at Louis Sullivan's full quote from which is derived his famous motto. Quote, it is the pervading law of all things, organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations, of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. And while Sullivan had not rejected the spiritual nature of mankind, making him more like the rationalist existentialist Soren Kierkegaard, we see he is talking about a Darwinian theory as applied to architecture. If nature survives, it is because it adapts to what is necessary. That necessity is the source of beauty. I would liken it to male peacocks which are not just colorful because the color is inherently beautiful. Their beauty shows health, which attracts healthy females, and that perpetuates the best of the species. Their color can also attract predators, so the males can lead them away from the nest, preserving the next generation. And so, in pursuing what is necessary, what form follows the function, Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright would argue that ornament is necessary as it speaks to the totality of human nature, mind, body, and soul. I've commented before that if you ask people who invented modern architecture, they will respond, Frank Lloyd Wright. WRONG! 
Frank Lloyd Wright had a mentor, and his mentor was Louis Sullivan, whose name is often forgotten even though his 1896 motto survives today as form follows function. And loyal viewers of Architecture Codex know that I consider Frank Lloyd Wright as the Elvis of architecture, bringing modernism to the masses, whereas Louis Sullivan is the Chuck Berry of architecture, the original creative force. And even they, Sullivan and Berry, had precedents from which they drew their ideas and to which they applied their talents. Chuck told Beethoven to roll over. Louis told McKim, Mead, and White the same thing. At the core of Sullivan's idea is that beauty is not applied to a building, but derived from a form which is necessary, based on purpose and material, and yet must include ornament. On the other side of the Atlantic, shortly after Sullivan's prominence, Adolf Luce in Austria, physically closer to Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx, also promulgated a modern architecture, but it was more austere, as delineated in his book, Ornament and Crime. And we would see European architecture evolve the bare Bauhaus geometries and non-materiality that would eventually be the hallmark of modern architecture worldwide. But even all that, too, began with Louis Sullivan. Back to the building. So what really makes this modern? Steel structure allows for thinner interior walls as they do not need to carry the building dead and live loads. This means a more efficient floor plan. The perimeter walls are also framed in steel so they can have bigger openings. This means the facade can let in more natural light than a traditional load-bearing wall. In the future, this would allow architects to go all glass and steel, but in 1896, Sullivan still applied ornament, primarily in the use of terracotta casts. The repetition of the terracotta modules created in a factory, reducing human labor time and costs, itself was a modern approach to building. And Sullivan allowed the terracotta clay color to show. He was not pretending it was another material. This honesty is also very modern. In the column capital at the base of the Guarantee Building, we see an ornate column capital. Now, a Corbusian or Bauhaus modernist would argue that the column capital was completely unnecessary. It was not performing the structural function as you would see on a Greek temple in that it did not need to angle the forces of the lentils down onto the column. And they would be right. But Sullivan kept the capital and decorates it with a delicate tracery that evokes the acanthus leaves of classical style, but brings in other new elements, some more bony, others more geometric. Is it permissible to say that this is modern without being too radical? Likewise, there are many other non-logical elements, such as the arched entryways and the round windows that cap all the vertical windows that act like flutes on a column. Any curve could be argued as not being inherent to the nature of steel framing, and yet because the skin of the building is terracotta, a ceramic material with characteristics more like stone and brick, the arch is a viable structural expression. And since terracotta's inherent logical nature allows the delicate repetition of form, modernism would say that it was appropriate to use the material in this manner. So the building is modern in the sense that it announces what you can do with both steel and terracotta working together. You could say that Sullivan's Guarantee Building, also known as the Prudential Building, was a transition building, bridging the gap between traditional architecture and the modern architecture that would eventually follow. The ornament, the amount of it, and the nature of it might discourage most people from classifying his work as modern. And indeed, as time went on, it probably contributed to Sullivan's career dissolving, his form of modernism appearing dated just a couple of decades later. His cantankerous personality and alcoholism did not help his career either. In his last days, he was penniless, and it is reported that his protege, Frank Lloyd Wright, paid for his funeral expenses. Shortly before the Guarantee Building, Adler and Sullivan designed the Wainwright Building in St. Louis, Missouri, and that might be considered the first modern skyscraper 
in America. While it has less ornament than the Guarantee Building, it too would be considered too decorous for pure modernists. But again, that assumes that modernity means soulless, and that was just not Sullivan's brand. The Sullivan approach to recognize that tall buildings had three distinct parts, base, shaft, and capital, drew upon classical collar motifs, but were not limited by classical design elements. It is logical, and thus modern, that the building has three natures, its relationship to the street, or site, its main body reaching upward, and the means by which its ascent is terminated. All of this is a rational understanding of how people relate to building. While the pure modernist might say, this is my building, this is my idea, and you people have to adjust to it. Shortly after the guaranteed building, Louis Sullivan designed the Carson Peary Scott Building, a department store in Chicago. We see that within five years, he had opened up the windows of the facade as the steel frame would permit. Here, the ornamental terracotta is limited to the inside trim of the window frame, but his ground floors, where the people on the street could see, were overtly decorated, this time in steel tracery that is iconic and still the standard measure of America's more organic-based modernism. American modernism, as practiced by Sullivan and Wright, was interested in new kinds of ornament and discarded the motifs of Greco-Roman or Gothic detailing. They looked directly at nature for organic inspiration. You can see aspects of American wheat and even Celtic influences because of their Scottish-Irish ancestry in their decoration. Both Sullivan and Wright were part of the arts and crafts movement. It was akin to the Art Nouveau movement in Europe, but emerged on their own with a greater sense of modernity. Sullivan's work spreads across the country, and while people still regard and treasure his buildings, only those in the design world remember his name or understand his impact on architecture. Some may disagree with my premise on what makes these particular buildings modern. You may argue that for it to be truly modern, it must be devoid of ornament. It must be strictly rational. It must ignore that human beings have hearts and souls that seek love and compassion. And you might say that the modernist must be strictly a machine aesthetic. And my most cogent and logical response to that would be wrong. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.